you Africans are enjoying the British summer. Yeah. It's, like home. It's, uh, it's glorious. Praise the Lord. Interesting, really, uh, the testimony that Jim was sharing. I don't know if you understand that type of testimony. But you know, the Bible makes it clear that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So God delights in dwelling within a person. And because God likes to dwell within a person, the enemy also seeks to occupy a person's life. And sometimes when a person is concerned, a demonic invasion can take place, and that demonic power can come in. And demons are not just general practitioners. Demons are actually specialists, so they work against a person in a particular area. And certain demons will work against a person's life to destroy the organs of the body, or uh, if you like, limbs of the body. They will work against that body. And if you think about it, the people today that get involved in the occult, there's an occult practice called automatic writing. And really the person yields the member of their body, their hands, to write certain things that are wrote under the inspiration of a demonic power. It's occulting. If that person was to lose their hand in an accident, that demon doesn't automatically leave. Because you can't remove by a natural means a spiritual power. It has to be removed spiritually. So you can't medicate the demon out, you can't operate the demon out. All that demon will do then is seek to support other demons that are there or will attach to another part of the body. And we have to understand these truths because they're not widely taught in the church today. But God wants us to be people that are knowledgeable about these things so that their influence upon our life can be destroyed. And those demons that will attach your body are actually eaters of flesh and drinkers of blood. They will destroy the body. You cast them out, sorry, in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They cannot oppose the name of both our names, the name of Jesus. Luke 11 and verse 20. The Bible tells us that Jesus said, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, he says, then know this, the kingdom of God has come upon you. So the deliverance of demons actually shows the kingdom being manifest in our midst. Isn't it part of the Lord's prayer to pray the kingdom come? That if you're praying the kingdom come, expect to see God move and deliver people from demonic calls. So Jesus said, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, know this, the kingdom of God has come upon you. So the proof of restoring the kingdom of God amongst men was the tremendous demonstration of the power of God over every other power. And this same power, this same authority becomes ours when we enter into the kingdom through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God through infant baptism. You can't enter the kingdom of God through observing certain laws or rituals. You enter the kingdom of God by being born again through putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only have we been saved from, from powers and the penalty of sin, but we've been placed in an amazing position of authority where we can exercise God's divine power over every other power, be it secular powers or be it demonic powers. Jesus Christ himself ushered in a move of God that was really vastly different than anything that any other person had seen or anything that came before. In fact, the amazing miracles, the signs, the wonders that Jesus performed were actually demonstrations of how the kingdom should operate. So Jesus was showing us how the kingdom should operate. That's why he appeared to the disciples over a period of time for 40 days after he raised from the dead. So over a period of 40 day, days, this regular appearance of Jesus, and he was showing the disciples, teaching the disciples, how to operate on the kingdom life. And it's the same here where Jesus is moving with these miracles. He's showing us how kingdom life should operate today. Jesus was the first room, the forerunner of those that not only raised from the dead, but he was the forerunner in many things that he did. And many would follow after him and do exactly what Jesus Christ did. When Jesus commissioned the 12 apostles, the Bible says that he gave them authority. And he sent those apostles out to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. 
In other words, Jesus is telling them to say the kingdom of God is within easy reach of all men. It's available to all men. And it's the same today. Nothing has changed. The kingdom of God is in easy reach of all men. It's available to all men. Only if they would embrace it. So the disciples went out and the disciples healed the sick everywhere. Luke 9 and verse 6 says they healed the sick everywhere. So there was no cloud of oppression that went into the work of God. There was no limited gospel, no apologies or clever thought out sermons for lack of power or failure. They simply obeyed the instructions of Jesus and saw amazing results of proclaiming the truth of the gospel. They healed people everywhere. And that's really saying today the church of the Lord Jesus Christ should minister to the same and heal people everywhere. Everywhere you go, every person you encounter, you have the authority in the Lord Jesus Christ to minister in the same way. We need to be people that proclaim the truth and the full truth of the gospel. If you were to stand up in court, you'd actually actually make a vow to declare the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I wish some pastors would do that today because there's many that don't proclaim the whole truth. We need to be people that declare the truth and see there's a great urgency to share the word of God today. There was such an urgency in the time of Jesus that not only did he appoint 12 disciples and give them authority over sicknesses, diseases, any ailments that came their way, but Jesus appointed 72 others some people quote and say it means 70. It doesn't really matter, folks. You know why it says 70 and then 72? Because in the Greek, often when the word 70 is used, they use the word dual after it. And basically that means two, so people add it on. But the Bible says that he sent out or appointed 72 others. Jesus Christ appointed them. Jesus Christ handpicked them from amongst believers. They weren't unbelievers. And he told them to go ahead of him. He says they were to go ahead of him to every town where he was about to go. Luke 10 verse 1. In other words, they were to prepare the people for the visitation of the Lord. They were to go ahead of him. And we need to be people today that go ahead of the Lord in the sense that we prepare the hearts of the people to receive him. That we share the word of God with a demonstration of power so that people can come to a knowledge of him. And to prepare the people to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, to be ready for him coming again. So these 72 went ahead, ahead of Jesus Christ, to every town where he was about to go. And when you witness the word of God to a person's life, you are preparing that person's life for a visitation, for an impact of the presence and the power of God. And God wants his presence and God wants his power to impact people's lives today. The 72 were told to heal any sick who were there. He didn't say, leave the difficult cases to me till I come. They were told to heal any sick. Where God is concerned, there is not a difficult case. It's man's logic, man's mentality that says one sickness and one disease is more difficult than the other. They were told to heal the sick wherever they went. This is the 72. And the Bible tells us they were told to proclaim again, the kingdom of God is near you. It's in the gain in easy reach. It's at a hand. These 72 returned to the Lord. The Bible says with great joy. So they returned with that joy in their lives after fulfilling the commission that Jesus had given them. And they said, Jesus, even the demons submit to us in your name. And this is interesting, really, because these 72 were only told to heal the sick wherever they went. They were told to heal the sick. So how did they encounter demons? Very easy, really. The demons were the power behind the sickness. So as they cast out the demons, the healing power of God manifested or was seen in people's lives. Often if you deal with a demonic problem in a person's life, you will find the person will heal up anyway. Simply because you're removing the source, the power base of the issue. It's like when we think of sicknesses and diseases today, we just consider them to be a condition. God never see, seeks uh, to, to allow you to walk and to think that this is just a condition. It's not in his word. 
God wants you to understand that it's not a condition. It's a demonic power that's affecting a person's life. And believers today don't like to, to hear that message. But yet, nevertheless, that's exactly what it is. You honestly think a cancer is just a condition, just a rogue cell. What has caused that to go wrong? I'm saying there's a power behind that, there's a life behind that, and you know, you need to curse the life within it, remove that power, and the person will live. You don't do those things because you're fearful of upsetting them in any way, shape, or form. That person will die. Ultimately, they will die. I know we're all going to die one time or another, but we live forever anyway. But we're not going to be terminated before our time. That's what I'm getting at. So we need to deal with the sicknesses. We need to deal with the ailments and realize there's something behind it. Even doctors recognize this stuff behind sicknesses. That's why they ask you, well, why have you got this rash? Are you stressed out a minute? How's things at home? How's things at work? They're trying to locate why. There's a problem within your life. You're looking for the root cause. And I'm saying that 99% of the problems that you would have, health-wise, there'll be demonic powers working in those areas. So Jesus sent out his 72 to heal. They came back and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And you know what, folks? They'll be subject to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. So we need to understand these particular truths. Now, not only did... Jesus commissioned the 12, and not only did he commission the 72, but he's commissioned everybody who believes in him today. That's what Mark 16, verse 15 to 20 is about. The 12 disciples heard that great commission, and the 72 heard that great commission, and they obeyed. The Lord Jesus Christ is waiting for his church to fully obey the great commission today. In other words, we're not to vary from it. And we're not to substitute or remove anything from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. People like to remove the, the bits that they feel offends them or doesn't agree with their understanding. If you were a person that do that, it wouldn't be long before all your Bible is tipexed out. We need to be people that believe the full counsel of God and deliver the full counsel of God. We are not to remove everything because the gospel is still the power of God for salvation for those who believe. And it's got the power to meet every need that mankind has today. Therefore, we have to make it a priority to share the full gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it would delight your hearts if you prayed for someone and you were healed. Delight your hearts if you prayed for someone and gave their life to Jesus Christ. That's the biggest one. You delight your heart and people are set free from demonic powers. It would delight you. And yet many miss out on that because they feel that they're called to stay rather than to go. But your word of God tells us to go out, to go out into the community to share the word of God. It's a must for today. We've got to be people that share the word of God. And it's no good nodding at me if you don't do it. Because you become a hearer of the word and not a doer of, of the word. And God wants us to be doers of the word. It's a commission. It's a command of Jesus. It's not a request. If you feel like it, and the weather's okay, and you've not had a bad night, go out. The Bible tells us to go. So we are obliged to obey the words of Jesus Christ and to do exactly what he says. And when you go, you will find that God will furnish anointing in your life as you go. So the disciples there, didn't say that 72, take nothing with you. No bag, no extra change of clothes, no money, nothing with you. He provided everything they needed as they went out, and he's the same God that he's always been. We're living in dark times today when I believe the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is needed more and more. And we've got to press in to all that Jesus has commanded us to do. Great thing about the disciples, it tells us on hearing the commission that Jesus gave in Mark chapter 16. It says they went out and preached everywhere. Not somewhere, they went out and preached everywhere. And he preached everywhere, and he says, And the Lord worked with them, confirming his word with signs following. I want you to notice it says the Lord worked with them. It doesn't say that they went out alone. It doesn't say that they moved on their own initiatives, their own abilities, their own giftings and talents. It says the Lord worked with them. 
as they were obedient to the Lord, he partnered with them. So they did what they were called to do, and God does that only he can do. So we need to be believers that understand that particular truth. He empowered them to declare his truth, and then he confirmed his word. <coughs> to confirm means to establish as being correct. So he established his word as being correct through power, through signs, through wonders, through the miraculous that happened consistently in the lives of those in the early church. And he did this so that people would know who he really is. There's got to be a demonstration of power. How did he establish these things to the disciples? He did it with supernatural signs and wonders, the working of miracles. And today the ministry of Jesus through the church is needed more than ever. Many people are finding it difficult to cope with life today. Pressures of life, marriage breakdowns, there's loss of loved ones, financial problems. They're just some of the frustrations that come upon people's lives. Then you've got all the cost of living rises. Then you're putting people in difficulties where people are considered to a pain in gas, the electric, or to a heat. It's very difficult for some people today. And these seem to be just some of the things that are pushing people over the edge. There's more people over the edge today than we've ever seen in history. We have seen an increase in what's commonly known as mental illness. It doesn't just attack one age group, it attacks youngsters to adults. It's attacking people in every walk of life because of the pressures and the difficulties that are placed upon them. Even the term mental illness can put a stigma or a label upon a person's life that's attached to them for the rest of their days. And we shouldn't be defined by that. It's Jesus Christ who defines who you are. I suppose most people that are hearing me right now, you will know someone, a friend, or you know a loved one, and you've seen them steadily worsen as a result of being mentally ill. There are many like that today. So what's important is to recognize what mental illness really is. You know, if I need to recognize what mental illness is, I don't go to the medical journal. I go to God's journal, and I start to look up what God says within his word. And if we recognize what it is that we're able to deal with it in the correct manner, mental illness is more than just a sickness or a condition that has come upon a person. It's more than just being degenerate, you know, a person that's they're getting older. The Bible tells us really what mental illness is. It starts to show us. In biblical times, they recognize it as a work of demonic power. And I believe they made the correct diagnosis in this area. It is a work of demonic power. Demon powers were given the task of gradually causing a person to lose their mind. We often see people that gradually change. And the reason why they gradually change is that the enemy wants to cause maximum suffering within the person's life until they completely break down. The Bible says he will keep in perfect peace in his mind is stayed upon him. So often where mental illness is concerned, the mind is certainly not stayed upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He promises you peace through everything, through prayer and petition. Make your request known to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So it's a moving away from what God wants. And that mental illness can cause people to break down. Even if a person seems to appear to break down or lose their mind rapidly, it's really a gradual process. It's just that it's gone unnoticed. And the slightest thing can tip the balance. God wants us to be able to minister into people's lives. We've seen young children that are having mental issues today. Young children are stressed out, strained out. Even just going through their exams, the pressures that are placed upon them, are really hard. Can you imagine you walking and someone placing a weight upon your head? It starts to weigh you down. Your knees will eventually buckle. It will bring you down. That's exactly what the enemy does with pressure and stress and strain. Jesus says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry about anything. He wants you to cast all your anxieties, all your problems, all your weights upon him because he cares for you. He will give you relief for those things. But you have to do your bit for him to do his bit. And he wants you to be free. But I'm saying there's a power behind it. There really is. 
many years ago, uh, my, my brother, who's with the Lord right now, he was telling us that he was in Nigeria and at this particular church he said they had these stones outside with chains upon them and he had people chained on these stones. And on the surface of it, it looks quite cruel to chain someone up outside the church. But he said, but well, what we do, we pray for them continuously. And as we pray for them continuously, the chains come off and the person is set free. Because they're set free of the demonic power that is influencing their thinking, influencing their behavior patterns, which cause them to lose their mind. And we need to understand that truth. We have names and we have terms for people that are mentally unstable. We might call them lunatics, for instance. That really comes from the cycle of the moon. That many people believe that certain cycles of the moon, a full moon, it would affect a person who would be called a lunatic. That's because of the power of witchcraft and demonic activity at that time. That's affecting a person's life. And there's many people that we would say are insane. Well, God wants you to have a sound mind. He's not giving you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and soundness of mind. That's your inheritance is a sound mind. So just because a medical profession might say that you may suffer from dementia doesn't mean that you should take that as a label that's going to come upon you. You should believe the word of God and the word of God says that I give you a sound mind. With one life I'll satisfy you. How can you be satisfied if your mind has gone? With one life I'll satisfy you and show you my salvation. There's a massive increase of different types of mental illnesses today or mind conditions today. Young children, everybody's being diagnosed today as being autistic. What's behind that? Even though there's a different spectrum of it, some see more than others, almost like they're in their own world, they need to be in Jesus' world. We have to pray for them consistently, whether they're at number one or number ten in terms of the spectrum that's affecting their life. We have to pray that this freedom would come into their lives. Whole groups of young people are affected this way. We see TV celebrities that are coming out now all the time saying they've been diagnosed as being autistic. With them, it's almost like a badge of honor. Sounds a peculiar thing to say, but it is. We all want to talk about, well, I've done this and it's improved my mental health. Only really Jesus Christ can improve your mental health. You're just getting a little bit of respite. And that enemy that's there will mount up and destroy a person's life. We need to be free of these things. God has never called us to have a mind that is disturbed in any way. Even one of the most famous Psalms, Psalm 23, what does it say? He restores my soul. He restores it. So when your soul, your intellect, your emotions and will are shredded by the enemy, it comes and he will restore them if you give him the opportunity. But it's given you the ability in you to minister in people's lives and even call those people that are labeled as being mentally ill to be healed and to be restored. God wants you to be healed. You look at some of the names of mental illness, schizophrenia. It may have been dual personality. If you've got more than one personality, the accepting of Jesus Christ living within your life, you've got a problem. The person needs to be set free in these areas. Bipolar. All these are common words. You never heard of them 20, 30 years ago. And now we're hearing all these things. They are really the symptoms of what the enemy is doing. A person who's depressed, they're given tranquilizers, things to calm them down. And they run them from life. Trying to get the person off them then becomes a major issue. Because not only does that de demon of depression work against the person on its own, but it works with pharmacia to affect the person's life. We need to be set free of all these things that are affecting us today in our communities. The churches are the same. And part of the problem is, is that Christians don't believe the truth of God's word. They have their own little theories and ideas upon it. But Jesus wants people to be set free. So we see many people that are affected today. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 7, it says oppression 
makes the wise man mad. What makes the person mad? Oppression. He doesn't mean angry when I'm using the word mad here. I'm talking about loss of mind, oppression. So oppression is of the devil. Jesus Christ, Acts 10 and verse 38, it says, Our God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Who anointed God? Jesus? His Father. Our God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went around doing good and healing all who were under the oppression of the devil because God was with him. So what was he calling sickness and the works of the enemy and oppression? So the Bible is saying it's oppression that makes the wise person mad. A person that seems to be wise suddenly comes under this heaviness, this weightiness from the enemy that affects their thinking, their behaviour patterns, the way they live. And it doesn't just affect them, it affects their families as well. Because the families have to live with that. But Jesus Christ set the oppressed free. And are you not to be like Jesus in this world? Are you not to go and to set other people free? Or is that just for God's peculiar ones? People that, you know, you look at and think, well, that's their ministry. No, the ministry of Jesus is given to you. Deliverance, even though we may say the deliverance ministry, is part of who you should be as a believer. It's part of the gospel. You can't just pick out the good parts and leave the ones that you think may cause you a little bit of hassle to other people. You've got to minister what God intended you to minister regardless of what other people are saying. Don't miss out the truth of God's word. So God is revealing where the oppression comes from and how it affects a person's mind. Deuteronomy 28, verse 28, one of the problems that come from disobeying God's word, the Bible says is madness. So it comes as a curse, the curse of the law from disobeying God. And that curse of the law can carry down generations until someone cuts it off. Have you never heard of the sins of the fathers coming upon the children? There's many believers today that don't believe that that can take place. Well, let me just say, Adam's sin affected you. So why do you think the sins of your father and your grandfather and your great father, great grandfather, do not affect you today? If I sin, if I do something wrong, it's going to have a knock-on effect. If I kill someone, it's going to affect the entire family. So what you do can affect others even after you. And this is the truth we need to understand. I was saying to some folks recently that we're called to be gatekeepers, aren't we? So the Bible tells us, watchmen on the wall, gatekeepers. A gatekeeper should watch what comes in and what goes out. He opens the gate and he closes the gate. So he only allows in the good things and he closes the things. Like what they had in the times of Nehemiah. Nehemiah stationed himself as a gatekeeper on the wall and he said, if you come here again, I'm going to lay hands upon you. I'm going to deal with you. Don't be trying to bring things in to the city on the day of the Lord. But yet we allow things in. We gatekeepers. But we open the gate and things come in. And even if it doesn't immediately affect you, because you as a father, because you as a mother have opened that gate, it can cause things to affect your children after you. Many pastors open gates to their congregations because they get into acts of sinfulness and shamefulness that should never be for a man of God. So if there's a man committing adultery and he continues to commit adultery, he's not repenting of it, and he seems to be getting away with it year after year, thinks he's on a good thing, he's opened the gates for those demonic powers to come into his family and open the gate for those demonic powers to come in to the family, which is the church, simply because he's not watched his life. What are you doing with the gate of your own life? Are you allowing the gate of your mind to just simply watch things continuously on telly that Jesus would never watch if he was sat with you? Are you reading things today that affect your mind? Demonic powers can enter you through what you read because when you read, you are lending your mind to somebody else's thoughts who wrote that book in the first place. You are lending your mind and the influences 
I said to people over the years, don't think a book can't influence you. Influence you. Karl Marx wrote the book, and you had communism that came from it. We've got the word of the Lord, and this word has saved many people's lives because of the power of the word of God. And the word of God may look like any other word, but it's different because the Bible said it's spirit and it's life. He brings his spirit and he brings his life. Never do anything independent of the word of God, like many do today. What the spirits told me. It's not in the word of God, what the spirits told me. That's absolute error. What spirits told you? The Holy Spirit always confirms. Exactly, his word. Never does anything independent of his word. It's the word and the spirit. The spirit and the word. Not one or the other. You've got to believe the word of God. Well, many people have opened themselves and are affected by demonic powers today that affect their mind and their thinking. The Bible says, forget not my benefits. The enemy wants you to forget benefits. He brings forgetfulness upon people. They go upstairs and think, what come up here for? Who's out? Who's answering me? <laughs> I don't believe that God wants us to be like that. I believe he wants us to be sharp. To be sharp in mind, of soundness of mind. And you forget anything, just start to pray against it. Don't just step set to almost be getting old and forgetting, forgetting what I'm coming here for now. Don't be like that. Accept what the word of God says, not what other people say. We've got to expect the truth. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy, the curse of the law actually brings madness upon people's lives. But well, we're thinking about curses now. What about the self-imposed curses? What about the things you say yourself that actually open the doorway for the enemy coming in? <coughs> How many people say things like this, I'm cracking up? What they mean is that their thinking isn't clear. They say something they shouldn't be saying, doing something they shouldn't be doing, and they say they're cracking up. Other people say, oh, must be losing it. That's a self-imposed curse. We should be never proclaiming over ourselves, I'm losing it. Losing what? Losing your mind. That's what you say when you're saying you're losing it. You're saying you're losing your mind. You're proclaiming it. And because the tongue is the power of life and death, you will eat of its fruit. Whenever you say something, a seed is sown, whether for good or for bad. That's why if you can't say anything good, you better have remaining quiet. Because a harvest will be produced of the things that you are saying that you didn't really want. And many believers today are sowing a harvest of things that they don't want. And they're wondering why they've come their way when they're child of God. Because they're creating those things through their words. And we create sometimes the sicknesses, the ailments, the problems of our mind. Because we say things like that. I'm losing it. These are more like modern sayings today that people use. My head's in bits. People say that. God's never called your head to be in bit. He restores the fragmented soul. I can't focus. I can't think straight. These are all statements that people are making that you should never make. I don't know if Jesus ever say, well, hold on a minute, I can't think straight. There's too many asking me questions, I can't think straight. I can't focus. What do we mean when we say we can't focus? We're not able to give our full attention to a problem or a person is saying, that is not within the word of God. That is not the blessings of God in your life. That's a demonic power that is seeking to affect you and will establish itself because you're calling it in with your words. The enemy is attracted to those negative statements and he never misses an invitation. Don't get an invitation here. Should we go there? I don't, don't fancy that one. He goes. He attacks a person's life and he enters in. So there's these self-imposed curses that people make. I'm just beside myself. You should never be beside yourself. <laughs> You've got a problem there if you're beside yourself. <laughs> you should just be yourself in Jesus, who he has intended you to be. So we say lots of things that attract the, the demonic like vultures. You know, a vulture can smell decaying flesh maybe 20 miles away. It can smell it. It's got excellent eyesight. And it doesn't matter how long that carcass has been there, you know, it's got a gut like a billy goat, it can eat anything. 
And demons are exactly the same. They smell decay. They sm Your words carry an odor. Even the fragrance of Jesus or the bad breath of the enemy. And the enemy holds in on them. Think of it like that for a moment. Your words carry a little bit of an odor and the enemy runs down. <laughs> and off he goes and affects your life because of the words you say. Be very careful on the words you say. When you read the word of God, you will find that God often quiets it down the people of God because he said negative things. Look about the children of Israel. God says, walk on the walls of Jericho seven times. On the seventh day, go around seven times and shout. Make a shout. But prior to that, he told them to remain quiet. You know why? They just look at the wall and go, well, you can't say this wall's going to come down. It looks a bit too thick for me. It's impossible. Look at the size of those soldiers that are now. They're getting the arches ready. There would have been all the doubt and all the unbelief. So what God was saying was, look, remain quiet. Because otherwise, you're going to mess it with the miracle that I want to produce in your life. And many believers today mess with the miracle that God wants to produce in their life because they can't keep their mouth shut. We need to learn to keep our mouth shut. No one can tame the tongue, the word of God says. The Holy Spirit can. The Holy Spirit can. And if you yield your tongue to the Holy Spirit, you will start to tame those tongues. So God wants people to remain quiet at times. Look at Zachariah in the Bible, Barbara John the Baptist. He didn't believe what Gabriel said to him. And he said, because you doubted, because you didn't believe, your mouth will be closed. So for the entire period of nine months of Elizabeth carrying the child, he could not say a word. The first words he uttered, when he had time to think about it for nine months, the first words he uttered was a naming ceremony, where he said, what should be the child's name? And Elizabeth said, John. And he said, there's nobody in your family called John. Let's send for a tablet. So they send like a little chalkboard, and he writes on it, John. Instantly, his mouth is open because he's now in agreement with what the angel said. Instantly, his mouth is open, and he prophesies. No more negative speak from that particular man. Be very careful that attacks, it attracts the enemy. And why I'm saying this is because sometimes mental conditions that come upon people loss of memory, forgetfulness, except to simply come because of the things they've been confessing over the years. They've now been established in their life. You need to break that power. God wants the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to be so different than other people in the world. Look at the children of Israel. When they lived in that area of Goshen, was it not different than the people around them? When the Lord brought that, that plague of darkness for three days on, on the nation of Egypt, the Bible is telling us that in Goshen, he still walks in light. Mm -hmm. And you as a believer today should be walking in light while others are walking in darkness. But your desire should be to bring them into the light through the supernatural acts of God, to be like Jesus in this world. It doesn't matter what condition they're in. And I'm saying this to you today because God is looking to commission the people. He's already done it. But he's looking to commission the people that will take that up and start to set people free. And we see vast amounts of people affected with mental issues today that Jesus Christ wants to set them free from. So all the way through the word of God, we see these things happening. People speak over your life. They're really proclaiming things. Anybody in an authority over your life that continues to speak things, you might end up believing it. It has an effect upon your life. We talk to people. We call people idiots. We call them stupid. We call them empty head. All sorts of things. You're the butty short of a picnic. The lights might be on, but there's nobody in. We say all sorts of things to people in sort of jest, but really there's a power behind it. So what about the people that have spoken over your life? You'll never amount to anything. They speak things. Well, people often speak things over your life related to your mentality. Are you thick? They say things like that, don't they? And you just upset that. The more you hear it being said, don't upset that. Jesus never says that over your life. He's never had one negative word to say about you. He loves you. So let's be people that understand that truth. Let's break the power of every negative word spoken over your life. Madness can come in different ways. Zechariah 12 and verse 4, it shows us those that oppose the nation of Israel will receive madness. 
It's a very dangerous thing to call God's ancient people. In fact, it's a dangerous thing to call any people of God because not only are you calling the bride of, of Christ, but God said, don't touch my anointing. Often ministers use that when someone's given them a little bit of flag. Don't touch God's anointing. But every believer is God's anointing. That's right. And that's what we need to understand. So don't be talking about other people or speaking about them because the Bible says if you do those sort of things, madness can come your way. It's always the penalty for it. If you're stepping outside of God's covering and grace, the penalty of the sin will come upon your life. It's when we're under the umbrella of his protection that it doesn't. Witchcraft will bring madness to a person's life. Jeremiah 50 and verse 30 shows us that. Anybody involved in witchcraft, any, involved, any person involved in drug taking, your recreational drugs that you think are giving you a little high, making you feel good, making all the problems go away for a few moments, they will open you up to the power of the enemy. Every time a person takes drugs and they hallucinate, they are seen into the spiritual realm. It's just that they've entered the spiritual realm by the illegal doorway. The only correct doorway is the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants you to enter his supernatural realm, but through the legal doorway, not through an illegal way. So when a person takes drugs and hallucinates, and he sees certain things and has certain sights before their eyes, that person has opened themselves up. A spirit of witchcraft will come in and eventually will lead them on to madness in their life unless it's dealt with. Any person, and I mean any person that comes into this church that have been taking drugs, or well, money taking cannabis, you know, with my mates to feel good, it doesn't matter what it is, the enemy sees that's an open door of coming to your life, you will need deliverance in your life. <laughs> Absolutely. You might not think you do, but you will need deliverance because the enemy will often come his ground within your life, convince you that you're okay, that you're the one who escaped it all. He will convince you that you don't need anything, but it enters your life because you do something that's illegal. And it's allowing the enemy to move in your life. And it opens a person up to witchcraft. Why do we say the drugs bring witchcraft? You know, have you ever seen a shaman use drugs? They use drugs. You know, even the Native American Indians, I call them that. <laughs> even the Native American Indians used to pass their little peace pipe around, didn't they? And the tobacco, what they smoked, brought out clouds and it enhanced the demonic powers that come into a person's life. So smoking will bring that power in. Just throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah 51 and verse 7. The systems of the world, believing the systems of the world can cause a person to suffer madness. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand. She made the whole earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore they have gone mad. You ever looked at things that are going on today and said the world's gone mad? Yeah. All these pronouns, all this LGBT stuff that we're hearing. Government's talking about, you know, we, we, we're just appointing a new levelling off minister. What are they talking about? <laughs> a levelling off minister. And you think, and they've gone mad. And the world has gone mad because they've bought into one system. Well, that's exactly what God says. So can we expect them not to think logically or right where the word of God is concerned? Absolutely, because they've fallen into those world systems. In fact, I shouldn't have used the word logically, because sometimes you have spirits of logic and reasoning that stop the flow of the Holy Spirit in people's lives, and they are demonic power. Intellectualism is often a demonic power. I'm too bright to believe in a God. I just think it's... it's is uh, fictitious. You get people that have that idea. That's a demonic power that affects the mind. And I'm saying those people eventually it will bring madness upon their life. God wants you free of these things. And Jesus said, didn't you? I said right at the beginning, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, and all this, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus said that to the Pharisees. You know why he said it to the Pharisees? Because the Pharisees studied the law of God, studied the word of God. And they would have knew that just before the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt, that when Moses and Aaron stood before the courts of Pharaoh, 
These magicians, these occultic practitioners, copied the miracles that God had performed until it came to the full miracle. And that was a creative power. And the enemy cannot create. And so the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Mm. This has to be the power of God. This is God himself working. So when Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, he's saying, I am driving them out by the power of God. And he said, know this, the kingdom of God has come upon you. So every time a person is set free, the kingdom of God is manifest in your life. That's why I'm not too bothered when a person cries out or shouts or screams because the kingdom is being manifest and the kingdom of darkness is being destroyed. Having said that, you can still close down any manifestation because you have the power to do that. And the racket and the noise that we're doing. I told you this before, but once when I was in uh, Uganda, I was in a church there, and uh, it suddenly exploded. I was, I was, I was preaching, but I hadn't even finished. And it suddenly exploded. How rude is that, the Holy Spirit to interrupt and preach? <laughs> We're going to be open to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And the presence of God broke out and, and people started to manifest, trying to get out the church door, running and jumping, trying to dive up for people to get out the door. But it was very difficult because the place was packed. People are rolling around on the front. And you saw these pastors on this woman on the floor trying to pin her down. I said, what are you doing? He said, um, we, we're trying to pin her down. I said, pin her down by the word of God. In the name of Jesus, be still. Instantly still. Instantly, that's the power and authority that we have in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to exercise that power. We need to exercise that authority. Another occasion, I may have told you this before, but it's worth saying again. We had a joint meeting once, and there was a couple that came, and she said, can my husband go and sit in the back room and pray? And I just thought, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I said, go in there. And then she came to me again and said, will you come and pray for him? Uh, he's having an episode. And I said, what do you mean he's having? Well, he's having like a... You know, and like a panic attack. He said, but if I give him this tablet, and I'm still walking as she's talking to me, I open the door, she said, if I give him this tablet, he'll calm me down in half an hour. And I, I, I come in the door then, and he's on the floor there, and he's, he, he's shaking, looking like he's having a fit. And I said, half an hour, be still in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. And instantly, he was still. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't understand what it was, and I said, if you said he's having a panic attack, it is a spirit of fear, panic, dread, worry, anxiety. All these things work together. We need to be setting people free. The problem isn't the power of God. The problem isn't the gospel message. The problem is the believers not believing the gospel message and taking it out. Because they're picking and choosing what they want to believe. It's like if you did the two seminars on the same day and you had one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit how to operate the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And another one of maturity or discipline. The door for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they'd all be going through it. But the one of maturity and the one of discipline, they would never want to go through. And Christians pick and choose today. Look, you can't just have your puddings, your sweets. You've got to have your carrots and sweets as well. They're the things that make you grow. And so we've got to grow in the things of God, embrace his full word, his full counsel, and release the full counsel of God to other people, whether they like it or they don't. Once you have run it by them, you have done exactly that. You have run it by them. And it's going to... I've heard people say to me, I don't want to listen to this day. I say, it's too late. You've already got it. Because I've already spoken it. And I know this. The moment I've spoken it to them, they're going to be thinking about it through the day. And then they come to me later, later on in the day and they say, uh, Dave, you know what you say before? I said, I thought you didn't want to hear about that. <laughs> and they go, yeah, but I've just got this question. Because of running by them. And all I'm saying, when you present the truth to a person, because the word of God is supernatural, it, oh, it enters them. It enters them and will start to work within their life. We need to rise up. We need to share the full counsel of God and then demonstrate to it. And a person said, well, I don't believe all this. And a man said to me, it's okay you telling me all this, Dave, but it's all passive. It's all yesterday, what Jesus did. I said, okay then, I'll pray for you now. Well, it went very quiet then. <laughs> but I prayed for him and God moved in power and healed that man. 
And all I'm saying is that we back it up with a demonstration of power. We're not moving in our own authority, our own power, our own steam. We're moving under the influence of the Holy Spirit as he directs us, and he will move in power. When you step out, he will furnish the anointed. We need to see people set free. We've got young people today whose lives are screwed up already. Absolutely. We've got older people booking into nursing homes like never before. Your family inheritance are all going on their health care. They're taking from you as well. We need to break that power and that cycle in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to pray right now if God's been speaking to you. You know, you want to respond to the word of God, you can respond to the word of God. You just want someone to stand with you in faith because of what you're going through or another issue, a family member will stand with you in faith. But God wants to move in power in your life. Be sure of that. And if there's any freedom is needed in your life, it will set you free. Thank you, Jesus. We give you glory. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. And in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, I pray that not only would we receive freedom today, but Lord, we would carry that freedom to other people that are in bondage to set the captives free with Jesus' commission, and it's ours as well today. And Father, we take that mandate of the Lord Jesus Christ and we run with it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.